Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension, and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks for, getting, for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's an extra special evening because this is the third in our series on finding Lieutenant Physicus. Tonight we have resolution. Um, our speakers will be Charles Konzitsky, Leslie Eisenberg, and Ryan Wubin. Uh, but before we get to our speakers, I'd like to introduce to you two splendid people who have come here to help us mark the evening. Uh, the first is Frank Fazekas Jr., who is the son of Lieutenant Frank Fazekas, and his wife, Evelyn Fazekas. Would you like to come up, please? <laughs> Evelyn is from Utica, New York, is that correct? That's right. And who grew up in Utica, New York? Oh, um, Mr. Babcock. Stephen Babcock. I learned that yesterday. From whom did you learn that? <laughs> now you have a friend who's from Eagle River? I do. And that's close to a town called? Rhinelander. And what's the famous animal in Rhinelander? Oh, um, <laughs> uh, hold that, hold that. <laughs> yeah, we got them only for a couple of days, but we got them. <laughs> and this is Frank Fazekas Jr. Frank, where did you grow up? Trenton, New Jersey. And where do you live now? Utica, New York. <laughs> Check, make sure. <laughs> yeah, I've had to pull my license out every now and then too. Um, do please come and talk with Frank and with Evelyn afterwards. We also have Sarah Clayton with us here. Sarah, would you like to be able to stand up, please? Sarah is a professor here in the Department of Anthropology. She's also an archaeologist, and she spent several weeks at the dig site this past summer of 2017. Um, so you have lots and lots of people here to come and talk with afterwards. And then if you would like, I'd be happy, you're staying at Union South. Mm -hmm. We could go to the set afterwards, and I will use my favorite three words again. <sighs> I will buy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you must be from New York. Of course it's for everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, and we'll talk with you afterwards. So uh, our speakers tonight are Charles Kaczynski, who's the Associate Director here at the Biotechnology Center, uh, and then Leslie Eisenberg, who is a archeologist and forensic anthropologist with the Wisconsin Historical Society, and she's also an honorary fellow in the Department of Anthropology here at UW-Madison. And leading off will be Ryan Wubin, who is a physician. He's a clinical associate professor and he's the medical director of MedFlight. So would you please join me and welcome all three to Wednesday Night at the Lab. So you may wonder why a physician is leading us off, but that's a whole other story. So uh, welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Uh, I'm Ryan Wubin, and uh, many of you may have been here about 18 months ago when we started this off. Um, with the first version of this talk, which was on the first season, and tonight we want to bring it to conclusion, uh, and with Frank and Evelyn here as well. Um, but for those who were not here the first time around, we're going to repeat a couple of the slides that we used the first time to basically set the story and set the scene. We didn't want to assume that everyone was here the last time, so we want to tell a little bit of the story of what actually happened and how we came to be here this evening. So imagine, if you will, the spring of 1944, um, you are part of a big uh, workup of um, 
soldiers and airmen and sailors coming over from North America to England. And this is kind of the situation in Europe in the spring of 1944. Uh, England is standing alone with the United States and the Commonwealth countries, and basically all of what you see across the English Channel all the way from Norway down to Spain is German-occupied Europe. And on the other side, way off in the distance, on the far side of the screen, is Russia in the Eastern Front. And so the Russians have been um, slowly moving westward and asking for the Allies to open up a second front and to um, relieve the pressure, which led to what we now know as D-Day. So in May 1944, this is the, the real situation going on. In the upper left corner there, you can see London. And uh, you can see how close, actually, that the, the coast of Kent and uh, uh, the southeastern coast of England is to the coast of occupied France, uh, Belgium, and Holland. And this is actually from an 8th Air Force map, uh, air aviation map from that time. And this is a situation um, in May of 1944 when the uh, 36th Fighter Group and the 22nd Fighter Squadron ended up in southeastern England to help uh, with the lead up to what we now again know as D-Day. And so the 22nd Fighter Squadron was one of many fighter squadrons that flew this aircraft, the P-47, um, basically in an attempt to keep the Germans on their toes as to where this invasion that was essentially known to be coming as to where it was actually going to land. Many of the um, uh, planners, especially on the German side, realized that the closest point is actually at the Straits of Dover at Calais, at the region of Calais. And so the Germans were very much focused on the fact that the invasion in their minds was probably going to come across the English Channel at Calais because if you remember four years earlier when the um, Allies were kicked out of continental Europe, they evacuated at Dunkirk, which is right up in, uh, along the coast there. And so they assumed that the uh, invasion was going to be coming across the, across the Straits of Dover, which is the narrowest point. And the Allies were very much trying to um, obfuscate where actually the invasion was going to happen. As we all know, it didn't actually happen um, at the Straits of Dover and at Calais. So the Ninth Air Force was, one of, um, was a, a tactical air force, and their job was primarily uh, infantry support and ground support. And so many people who know their history will know that the 8th Air Force was the um, heavy bombers and their escorts that went across um, during the strategic air campaign against Germany. But the 9th Air Force was the tactical air force that was supporting um, the ground troops in the lead up to um, D-Day. And so their role was primarily to keep the idea in the Germans' minds that the invasion was coming across at Calais by basically ranging far and wide for targets of opportunity in that region and, and basically strafing and bombing anything that they could find. And they basically, at that point in the war, essentially owned the skies during the daytime. And so this is the, as many fighter squadrons and, and, uh, and units from that time, um, this is their squadron patch from that time. This is the 22nd Fighter Squadron's uh, Fighting B from 1944, and keep this in mind because we will revisit this uh, a little later. And again, we talked about the um, P-47 Thunderbolt. This was the largest uh, single-engine, uh, single-seat fighter in use by any of the combatants during the entirety of World War II. And this is me up at the Oshkosh Air Show a couple of years ago, just to give you some perspective on the size of this airplane, and that it is a very large airplane. The other thing that you might um, that we will revisit a little bit later, if this thing works. Um, but standing over me in the wingtip there, you can see the four machine guns pointing out. And I bring that up because that's going to become important later. There are a couple of things that um, have serial numbers stamped on them, um, on any of these aircraft uh, from that time period. Um, each machine gun has a serial number. The engine has a serial number, and the airframe has a serial number as well. And those will become important later. So just to set the stage, um, May 27, 1944 was a Saturday. It's about nine days before what we now know as D-Day was about to happen. And any good weather day that uh, presented itself, um, squadrons of aircraft would be tasked with various um, uh, jobs across the channel. Some of it was reconnaissance, uh, taking lots and lots of photos at the same time that the Allies were trying to obfuscate where the invasion was coming from. The British were very much trying to find where 
the Germans were constructing V1 and V2 um, rocket sites that were about to start um, raining down on um, London and England in a short period of time, and they knew this because of the resistance and intelligence. And those things had a range of about 100 miles, so you draw a line of about 100 miles from London and England, and that's exactly where we're at in this northeastern corner of France. The bombers were going across, hitting targets in Germany. Fighters were going across and fighting the German Air Force, and uh, the Ninth Air Force was tasked with keeping the German army pinned down where it was. And so they were also very much looking for any evidence that the Germans knew what was up, because if they started to see units moving from the Calais area down to the Normandy area, that was important information to know because that would give them advance warning that the game might be up. So May 27th was a Saturday. Um, We've, I've obtained the records from the Air Force Historical Branch down at Maxwell Air Force Base in, uh, in Alabama. And unfortunately, the records of the 22nd Air Force don't really describe what the target was that day. We don't have much in the way of information as to what was actually um, uh, the purpose of that flight. Presumably, it was as I described it, which was uh, looking for targets of opportunity. Um, the Saint-Omer area of northeastern France, um, there was a German Air Force base. It was a regional headquarters. The German Army had many units in that area, and the coast from Dunkirk to Calais is only about 25 kilometers or so away. So it was kind of an important nerve center. It was a good day. The visibility, uh, per the re um, records that we do have, um, the visibility was good, and we only have a couple of sentences to describe what had actually happened. Um, and so Lieutenant Fizikas was part of a, um, a squadron that was of the 22nd, or, uh, sorry, a unit of the 22nd uh, Fighter Squadron. And all we have is this uh, few sentences from a wingman who was part of the um, uh, squadron as well, a Lieutenant Knott, who basically when he returned to England, um, reported what we have in front of us here, that they were flying along at 10,000 feet, and he made this gentle diving turn from his formation, and he kept losing altitude, and he hit the ground. And that's really essentially all that we have to go on. And there was no radio call. We have had a couple of instant, uh, little tidbits of information since that time that there was um, enemy flak, uh, or the anti-aircraft fire, um, that probably hit him, and that's essentially all that we know. And because of the timing of all of this, this was in, on, in May of uh, May 27th, D-Day didn't happen until June 6th, and this part of France wasn't liberated until September. So at the time that he went down, this was behind enemy lines. So a squadron goes out, they come back with one person missing, and that's essentially all that we have in the chaos of war and all that was about to happen within the next 10 days. It was a very chaotic time. So fast forward um, many, many years, and, and so now we're into the 2000 teens. And that part of France where Lieutenant Fizikas went down is this little town of Bousquer, France. And so we have some little bit of information as to where he went down. Um, we actually have an eyewitness who described to um, people where he thought he went down. And so you go to Google Earth, and this is what the area looks like today. Um, this is that big line going from the top center down to the bottom right is actually a high-speed TGV, the kind of the bullet train of France. Um, that's a high-speed rail line. Um, this is agricultural part of France, very near the Belgian border, up in the north, very northern part of France, as you can see from the other photo as well. But when the, um, to kind of fast forward through a couple of, and we talked about this at length in the last um, uh, lecture, the eyewitness pointed to an area in a field where he was insistent and sure that that's where the crash had occurred. Um, a, the Def Department of Defense has a, an office called the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency that is tasked with the, um, the job of trying to make an accounting for all of these missing airmen and soldiers and sailors. And so they had sent out a team in 2012, I think it was, interviewed um, this gentleman who was 12 years old at the time 
and was happened to be standing on the back uh, area, I don't want to say porch, it was the back door of his family's um, house, and saw the airplane crash. And he was 12 years old at the time, and this made quite the impression on him, of course, uh, in the chaos of war and, and to a 12-year-old boy. And so he had pointed to an area in a certain field that was, um, in his mind, that's where the, act, that's where the crash occurred. And so um, he told this to the DPAA team, and if you go back and we talk at length in the previous talk about how we came to be involved in, with this at the, at, as the University of Wisconsin, um, that's a story unto itself, but we need to keep moving forward. But just to so kind of speed forward, um, the team hired a German firm that does this thing called ground penetrating radar. And they had scanned that field, and that field came up empty. There was nothing in that field when they had done the scan. And so this was in the spring of 2016. Um, we were scheduled to go into the field in the summer of 2016, and we weren't quite sure if we were in the right spot. So frantic phone calls going back between DPA's headquarters in Hawaii and Washington, D.C. and Madison, Wisconsin, and a um, Air Force uh, researcher, um, and I met people from that office uh, this past March, but I did not meet the particular person who actually found this photo, went to an archive in the UK, and they found this photo. So if you go back, in this photo, this is Google Earth. Some things have changed. Some new buildings occur. That whole rail line didn't exist. But some of those roads are exactly the same as what they were before. And they went through this archive of aerial photos from the Second World War, and they found this particular photo, and this road still exists, and these buildings still exist, and you line up that intersection, and you find something right there. If that's shining, yeah, that's showing up there. So the British, I mentioned before, were frantically looking for these V1 and V2 sites, and they were taking photos of on clear weather days. And this photo was taken actually two days after May 27th, 1944. So it was either May 29th or May 30th of 1944. And so just by sheer chance, the British took a photo of our crash site. And if you blow it up, that's what you see. Some of these buildings, like this building right here, and these buildings, some of these buildings still exist, as do some of these roads. So you line up. Google Earth with a British photo reconnaissance picture, and where Mr. Koosh was insistent that it was this field, because he said it was north of the access road. There's a little access road. And he was right, but the problem was that road from 1944 had changed to where it is today. So it was north of the road. The problem is that the road changed. And so when you plot that out, it was actually south of the existing road right now. Um, and there's a whole other story to all of this as well. Um, but uh, basically, we were in the wrong field. And so in the spring of 2016, frantic movement forward, and the game is on. We're going into the field. We're going to start working. And this is where I'm in a transition. And so that 12-year-old boy who witnessed the crash is now, at the time in 2016, is now 84 years old. And his name is um, Mark Kush, and this is him. And I will transition to Leslie. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and welcome to all of you who may have been here for the December 2016 presentation. And for those of you uh, who are new to this story, um, there, there's more to come, so thank you for coming this evening. Um, any good archaeologist knows that it's important to have informants. But time passes, people get older, but it's still important to hear the, hear the stories. And this kind of work is all about stories. It's the archaeology that allows you to tell the story. So the archaeology is really a tool to be able to tell the story and to get to the truth of the matter. So we spent lots of time talking. I spoke to other people in the village, spoke to the mayor, the previous mayor, 
And all of this is important because you'd think that over these many years, people's memories would fail, but they really don't. This event um, marked their lives and still does today. Mr. Kush, who you saw in the previous photo, was the witness who lived across the street from the crash site. Um, this is the landowner, Mr. Carton, who uh, over the period of two separate summers allowed us to work in his fields to uh, locate and recover um, the plane and, um, and the pilot. You really can't tell because the lights are on, but the soil was just god awful. It was, um, for anyone who's a gardener, for anyone who works in a field, um, clay is not fun. And, and that's all we had to work with. Um, and it gets even better, so stay tuned. <laughs> so we, we dug a number of exploratory trenches because although we had that aerial photograph, and we could guesstimate the scale of, of the crash site, um, we still needed to pinpoint that location relative to buildings that were still on the landscape today and that appeared in that aerial photo that was taken two days after the crash. So we dug a number of exploratory trenches and unfortunately, I don't think you can see it here, um, but the soil begins to change color and continue down in a sloping manner. And for us, that was really promising. And it, it told me that we were on the edge of what looked like some kind of trench. We didn't know how big it was. We didn't know how far extended. But it was the first clue that we were actually in the right place. And this is all about teamwork. Um, like any family, most of the time people get along. Sometimes when it's hard work and it's hot and it's raining and it's muddy, um, you know, everyone, there are always issues in field work. But we had a great team in 2016, a great team in 2017, and it's really been my honor to work with everyone who is in the field with us. This was fairly early on in 2016. Bones started showing up in the screens because all the dirt we excavated, we screened because we didn't want to pass by any kind of uh, important evidence that would help us identify the crash site the type of plane and anything else that was found in, in the wreckage. We also found, as you can see on the upper right, a part of a tire. Um, at that point, we didn't know it had come from the plane, but the diamond pattern of the tire was, was in all ways consistent with the tire that is typically furnished on a P-47D. These uh, bones on the lower left, by the way, were animal bones. Um, but you all knew that already, right? <laughs> Chuck didn't. Um, Tom, is there some way we can lower the lights just a little bit? Because this is important. Because once we found these changes, um, we got really excited. And what we were seeing um, and if you just follow here, and hopefully we can dim the lights just a little bit, there was a greenish, brownish, blacked, blacked um, oily stain that smelled like fuel. And when we found this, we knew we were absolutely in the right place. And what we needed to do was clear away from the stain and clear under it. I'm going to keep going. Okay. Uh, 
So it's not quite as vibrant, you know, a, like a gas slick at a gas station after it rains, but it had that iridescent quality to it. It was oily, and because it had been capped over these many years, um, it was protected in, a, in an environment that didn't have any oxygen to it. But the minute we began clearing off the soil and saw the stain, these fumes that had been encapsulated for these many years were, were quite strong and um, made it quite difficult for anyone to work in contact with that area for more than about 10 minutes at a time. This is kind of a bird's eye view of that stain. This was the area in question. As, as, as you can see, this is the top of the field. And we kept going down and we kept terracing um, for the protection of the excavators so the walls wouldn't collapse in on us, but also as a way for us to get in and out of the excavation carrying heavy buckets of soil. But we still had a lot of dirt to move. And in the process of moving that dirt, there were two separate discrete areas where we began finding uh, machine guns. And if you remember Ryan's image from early in the presentation, on each wing there were four machine guns. Uh, interesting in terms of the historic record, which um, can sometimes be flawed depending on who's doing the writing. Um, the Germans indicated that they had taken three of the eight guns. We know from the six guns we found and the eight guns that are on the plane that they could have only taken two of the guns, not three of the guns. This gives you some idea of quite how heavy one of the guns was. I think we guesstimated probably about 80 pounds per gun. And so we found six of them, two in one area and four in another. And as Ryan mentioned early on, those guns have unique serial numbers unto themselves. And those serial numbers are connected back to the plane itself. So a particular machine gun can be identifiable as to a particular aircraft. So these are the guns, some of which are more mangled than others. We cleaned off as best we could serial numbers from two of those guns that matched uh, directly uh, with the P-47 of First Lieutenant Frank Fizikas. And here is one of those serial numbers. Here is, is Frank. We first met Frank on site uh, in 2016. Um, typically on these kinds of missions, um, DPAA, uh, the agency, federal agency that Ryan mentioned, does not permit family members on site for um, reasons that are important to them and also perhaps more important to the family. And that is, we don't know at this juncture whether, if remains will be found and if they will be of the person you think they are. Someone may have stepped in for somebody else. Um, there are a number of reasons, even at disaster sites around the country, um, where the person you find may not be the person you actually think it is. So um, quite unusual, but we were thrilled to have Frank there. Um, and he may want to say a few words about this. But the important thing was that when Frank came on site, we all stepped back and gave him as much time as he needed to be at this place. Um, where his dad last was. At that point, we didn't have a positive identification, but we knew the guns were associated with his dad's plane. 
and that this notion of a sense of place for someone who you've never met but is close to you is is important and and we respected that as a um, military pilot himself and an aeronautical engineer um, the plane parts were telling to Frank and he spent a lot of time looking at the plane parts that came out of the ground um, trying to understand where they came from uh, and it was fascinating to watch that process. Uh, Ryan also, by the way, is a pilot. He is enamored of plane parts, got us information when we needed it, um, so we were thankful to have him on the team. Thankfully, we didn't need him as a doctor. <laughs> Here's Frank again. Frank worked harder than anyone on the team that first year. Um, and we welcome Frank and Evelyn back to any future excavations we may work on. <laughs> the, the problem is he's never had to work for me. <laughs> Here is, is Frank and Mr. Kush, the witness, uh, who was 12 years old at the time of the crash, meeting for the first time. Um, and for Mr. Kush, this was, um, I hate the word closure, but I think it was a camaraderie um, and a connection that neither person in this photograph probably ever thought would happen and, and made it all the more moving because of it. Just a, an example of some of the materials we pulled out of the crash site. Uh, spent cartridges, 50 millimeter cartridges, plane parts, and none of this stuff had any kind of probative or legal um, connection. In other words, you couldn't pick up a piece of aluminum and say it came from that P-47D. So lots of this became scrap and was reburied on site at the end of the 2016 excavation. So the deeper we went, the wetter it got. And we had a number of rain days, and you keep working until you can't write notes anymore, or you can't take photographs anymore. Um, but we knew we had a job to do, and so we kept working. And this is the dirt that went into the screen that people went through to make sure they, they collected everything possible. And this is Ella, one of our best people in the field, who was a student, an undergraduate at the time, trying to get that muck through the screen. Because it was important to all of us. I mean, I can look at this photo and laugh now, but it was important to do the job right. <coughs> And this is Ian, not waist high, but um, certainly boot high, trying to continue the recovery. And this is um, one of the images left at the end of the 2016 field season where you can see larger and larger pieces of aircraft in the excavation. And at the end of the 2016 field season, the area was covered with a blue tarp, and the entire excavated area was backfilled by heavy equipment. And at that point, we didn't know whether we'd have the authorization to go back. As it turns out, well, here's our team from 2016. A smaller but yet most effective team in 2017. And so we began, uh, we were allowed to go back because the promise of finding more important information to link this site with First Lieutenant Fizikas um, was obvious. And so we were allowed by DPAA to go back. We removed the backfill, 
came down upon that blue tarp that was set in 2016. And we began the excavation in, in the area that was most promising. There were a lot of big, heavy airplane parts, none of which were obviously identifiable in, initially. Um, but then we started clearing away the dirt from these large parts. There was quite a bit of burning, very big uh, airplane parts. This gives you a kind of a global sense of once we got to the bottom of the crater, just how circumscribed and how localized the material was. And here is Dr. Sarah Clayton, who's here with us tonight, um, doing her best to try and free a big piece of metal from, from the crash site. It, it was, um, you'd think the area might be more, would be larger, but really it was very, very focal. And so it made it easier for us to do our job. We begin to see burning um, here. And, and the reason you'll see in the next slide why we have this photo in here, um, at the end of the 2017 excavation, uh, we recovered one of the propeller blades from the P-47D, uh, which now sits in front of the city hall in the village of Bousquer, um, and that will have a plaque not affixed to it, but near it. So I'll hand it back over to Ryan for now. So I showed earlier the, uh, the earlier version of this, um, of this uh, squadron badge. And I put this in here just to kind of show the lineage of these squadrons and, and the historical background that they are very proud of and that they continue to this day. So suffice it to say that we found the remains of Lieutenant Fizikas um, through the course of these two field seasons. Um, we were able to recover him, and uh, um, the remains were then turned over to the Defense Department. There's a process there. It's kind of a complicated process. But first, it actually goes to the French police, um, and then the, their version of a district attorney, if you will, has to weigh in on it. And when that is determined, and we you know, had done all the work to basically make the case, the um, Department of Defense uh, steps in and they start their process of recovering him from the French, bringing it to the, um, I think, Landstuhl, Germany. And then at that point, it is evaluated, the remains are evaluated by a physical anthropologist and then brought back to the United States. And that whole process, we finished up in the third week of August, I believe it was, of 2017. Um, and then we got word that there was uh, an internment planned, a funeral planned, um, in late March of 2018. Um, so I was able to go with my family to Washington, D.C. during spring break. If the kids are watching, thank you very much for coming with us. Um, my daughter was planning on going to a beach, and I said, no. Um, so we uh, went to Washington, D.C., to Arlington National Cemetery. And um, on the last week of March, uh, we were uh, allowed to be a part of the process of um, the funeral and, inter and interment of uh, Lieutenant Fizikas. And so to kind of bring the arc of the story to a close, all of the work, if you go back and look at the uh, previous talk that we had given and the talk that Sam had given even prior to that, um, so this is actually the third talk that we've given on this, very, on this project over the last several years, but this kind of comes to closure. This comes to, again, a word that is maybe overused, but this kind of brings it full circle. And um, I can say as someone who's not been in the military uh, or anything like that, the, um, the, the ceremony of what goes on with an internment at Arlington National Cemetery is uh, something 
that should be witnessed. And I think the, the gravity of the situation, the um, respect <laughs> that is paid, uh, even if it's 73 years later, is something that is, um, you just have to see it. And it is something that will stick with you for the rest of your life. And I will just kind of go through some photos of what that whole process entails. And so Lieutenant Fizikas was then laid to rest with his wife in Arlington National Cemetery in March of 2018. And even after the passage of all these many years, it was something that uh, I think will stick with all of us. And I was fortunate to uh, represent the UW at that ceremony. And I could say things here, but I think the word, the pictures speak for themselves. But then the last chapter goes back to Leslie and just a couple of weeks ago. It was, and uh, it's a treat for me to see Evelyn and Frank Fizikas here in Madison because uh, I had the pleasure of, of spending time with them uh, on May 8th in Busquer, where we excavated uh, over the, this last year since we left the field last August. I worked uh, closely with the mayor um, with translations back and forth for uh, a day of commemoration. And um, May 8th, as many of you know, is VE Day in Europe. And so it was quite fitting that uh, the commemoration was held that day. Um, roads in, in the village were closed off. Um, teachers, school children, the current mayor, former mayors, mayors from neighboring communities, uh, four representatives uh, from DPAA, um, based both in the States and in Germany, were in attendance. Um, regional politicians from northern France were there with us, and many people from the village and neighboring villages. There were also people, as you can see in the right-hand photograph, this gentleman is French, but he collects World War II memorabilia and military vehicles um, and has been to the States many times. The ceremony was called for 11 a.m. There were many people, as I mentioned, in attendance. There were former uh, in French, the word is combattant, former fighters uh, from Europe who served in Algeria, um, many of whom uh, were quite elderly, but many of those were pallbearers, no, I'm sorry, um, flag bearers. Uh, what you are looking at in this photograph um, is the monument to war dead from World War I and World War II. And for anyone who's not traveled to Europe, um, there is a monument like this in every village in France. What's different about what happened on May 8th of this year is that um, there was an unveiling of, and, and I'll show you in a moment, of a plaque on the monument to the war dead uh, in honor of First Lieutenant Fizikas. And it was because of this event that Evelyn and Frank uh, joined us there. People brought uh, flowers and laid them at the base of the monument. 
Um, here's, I don't know if you can read it. it, it is in French, but it says to Frank Fizikas, first lieutenant of the U.S. Army Air Corps, pilot of a P-47D, um, struck down by the German Army, May 27th, 1944, in Busker. Um, and, and it gives the, the place name of where the plane went down. Um, and it honors the pilot. Here is Mr. Kush and his wife Suzanne, the, uh, the witness, uh, with Major Christopher Gamble, who is with the DPAA European Detachment in Germany. Here's Frank, who is one of the speakers, and one of the more eloquent speakers, um, because he began his presentation in French. Um, did a fine job. No one threw tomatoes. Um, but he spoke from the heart and brought with him a, a, uh, an artist's rendering of his dad's photo that um, was a fairly large format that in order to get it here, uh, he dissembled the frame, um, dissembled the glass, protected each piece of it, and then reassembled everything so it could be on display uh, in, in the city hall for the presentations. And we leave you with this because this is what the work we do is all about. Um, it's about the families, it's about the recoveries, and we're just a tool in the process to be able um, to honor people who have served for this country. And uh, it, it's been an incredible experience. Um, and I don't know whether, Frank, you'd like to say a few words? Frank is not shy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> There's a video of, uh, of me giving my little speech in French. You will not see that video today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know my wife was taping that. Anyway, uh, I think the most important thing that I can say tonight is, um, and I, I cannot adequately thank the University of Wisconsin for making it possible for me after 73, 74 years to reunite my father's remains, my mother's ashes, she passed away about six years ago, at Arlington National Cemetery, to bring him home and bring them back together after all that time, uh, something I, I, I would never have thought was possible uh, until, well, even two years ago when I got the phone call, I thought, is this for real? They, they really are going to do this. And uh, it was done with such uh, compassion and, and respect. Uh, uh, I just can't say enough. Uh, you guys were, were great, were wonderful, and I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. So Frank, you bring up the, the 2015 call. Yeah, it was, it was a difficult call. But I have to say, <clears throat> I had asked Frank that his father's case be our pilot project here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he agreed to it. And to let you know, the first year that we did this, the U University of Wisconsin-Madison paid for the pilot project. The second year, DOD paid for it. However, that second year, it opened up to about a, a handful of other academic partnerships with DOD, and this year alone, it's opened up even more. So your father to this day is still serving. He was the test. So your father's case has recovered over probably a half, or close to a, you know, a half dozen MIAs thus far with this academic partnership. So I appreciate you and I thank your father for still serving to this day.
There's no mic normally on no microphone there. I turned it off. Yes, he was. <laughs> Questions? What is DPAA? Uh, DPAA is the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, so it's a, a group, it's a part of the Department of Defense. Was the identification of the remains solely on the identification of the plane? Uh, no, it was, uh, we did recover. Can you repeat the question so people Oh, talking? yes. Say the question one more time, please. <laughs> was the identification of the remains made solely on the identification of the plane? So were the uh, identification of the plane solely on the, the identification of the plane? Uh, no, we did actually find uh, a number of possible human remains that were tested and analyzed and matched with Frank Fazekas here. Other questions? <laughs> Do you have the serial number of the aircraft? Yes, we do have the serial number of the aircraft. So we had the, um, whenever a, a flight crew went missing during World War II, a, a thing called a missing air crew report was filled out, and the acronym for that is called a MACR. And that started in, I think, late 42, early 43, and um, they were sequentially numbered, and so a MACR was um, filled out. And um, that macker is all in the National Archives and accessible. And so on that macker are basically that quote that I had uh, on the one from the Lieutenant Knott, the serial number of the airframe, engine, and any weapons that were on board. So you can imagine like a B-17 four-engine aircraft with 10 crew would have 10 names on it with their serial, their, their um, identification numbers, plus also uh, a B-17 might have 10 or 15 50 caliber machine guns and all of the serial numbers, the serial numbers of the four engines and so forth. And that becomes um, valuable from a probative <coughs> evidence standpoint. As a doctor, I'm learning new words. Well trained. Um, uh, to basically make the case of the, first of all, that the aircraft that you found is actually the aircraft that you found. Our case was a little bit more simple in the sense that it was a single seat airplane with only one crew member. So those two serial numbers that we found that matched basically made the case. And then the DNA on top of that is just basically seals the case uh, without beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, did the Germans remove most of the airplane? Or why would this landed in a, uh, I, I take it, a farm field or something like that? Why wasn't it uh, true that someone else had observed what happened? Uh, so the Germans did come by. I mean, there was a, in the in the um, the Macker report there was a translated um, uh, report from a German anti-aircraft unit. I mean, it's only a couple of sentences. There's not really much there um, from the town of Watten, which is just down the road, presumably from the unit that shot him down. Um, they that's where the two or three machine guns that they took came up. Um, the there were other witnesses. We actually we knew of Mr. Kush, but we actually came across a. Um, we were sitting in the pub one day when it was pouring rain, um, and uh, one of the other former mayors actually knew who we were and came up and talked to us as well. And, and so there were other eyewitnesses um, that basically corroborated. The other thing was is that this um, site burned for several days. Um, and so actually you saw a couple of the pictures of the um, exploded ordnance, so the 50 caliber machine gun rounds. Many of them were spent because they, they had gone off, they had cooked off in the burning over the last couple of days after the aircraft went down. So it, there wasn't much for them to do in the immediate aftermath. Um, do you know why they took the machine guns? I mean, were they functional, were they scrap, were they souvenirs, was any, any reason given? Nothing was written down. The historical record is lacking, so I, I don't know. All of the above. I don't know that we have an answer to that question. No, we, we have no idea why they took those two machine guns, um, but we do know that the archaeology archae tells us that they only took two. <laughs> Eight, eight minus two. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I've not been 
questions at the end of the previous two lectures. How was this aircraft and Lieutenant Pasique's remains, how were they buried so deeply? If it was on It was a dead spin and just right. completely it punched the ground and it punched it so hard. It, Oh. The question has to do with why uh, were, was the aircraft so deeply embedded in the ground? And, and I can say that we were at the end of last year's field season, we were down probably about five and a half meters into this clay soil. And it has all to do with the engine and the spin of the propeller and the and the angle um, of of impact and um, it also has to do with what happens after something gets buried. Um, we know that the Germans took some scrap. We know that locals took some scrap, but people began to fill in the crater and the field went back into cultivation as it was when we first got there in 2016 and as it was when we got back there in 2017. So um, it's just how sites develop over time. It's how cities grow. I've done a lot of archeology span in lower Manhattan in New York City. Um, and dirt gets put down and, and so what you see on the landscape today, or in this case, what you don't see on the landscape today, tells you a lot about the activities that happened post-crash. The other part of it is, is that a cruising speed of a P-47 is somewhere in the order of 250 miles an hour, 300 miles an hour. Um, I mean, it, go, it can go much faster, but they were probably cruising back to England and the reason why we say that is because we never found a bomb, so we presume that they had already been on their, <coughs> on their bomb line. We were prepared. We had a procedure in place if we found ordnance. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I just came back from a World War One battlefield in Belgium, and we had an on-site EOD guy uh, at all times. Um, but if you take one half MV squared, you know, going into the ground from 10,000 feet, um, it buried itself pretty deep. I think that's the simple answer to the question is that uh, it just went in fast and hard. Um, how or why did this project become your pilot project? How did you Chuck? get involved in this particular Repeat the question. So uh, the question was, why was this pilot selected? Um, it was actually given to us um, as a possibility of a, a high probability. So for being a pilot project, we wanted a case that had a high probability, and this was the case that was presented to us. There was no selection. Um, it was just by chance. I guess to put that into perspective, there are something on the order from Pearl Harbor until now, and we said this in the last talk that we gave, there are 82,000 missing um, service members from just Pearl Harbor on. That doesn't even include World War I. Um, and if you, I think it's on the order of 40 some thousand that are in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, a big number of them are in, in the Pacific theater. Um, and a good number of that are, were, are probably irrecoverable in terms of they were lost at sea uh, or shot down at sea. Um, and so what DPAA has is this thing called a master excavation list. So they have a list of cases and basically, um, we mentioned back in 2012, they had sent a team around to interview Mr. Kush and so forth. So they send these teams out to work these cases up. They have historians on staff. Um, and basically, they put all of that together with the historians, the historical record, and all of that. And they come up with this thing called the master excavation list. And that's how they basically triage, if you will, cases for a particular year. And then they send out teams to work those cases up. But if you can imagine, there are thousands of cases still to be worked out. <coughs> and to add to that, on an annual recovery, it's predominantly uh, around 100 recoveries per year. So you can imagine the number 83,000, 82,000, 100 recoveries. That's why I, uh, DOD is becoming more involved with the academic institutions. And as I stated earlier, UW-Madison was the pilot 
with DPAA. So we were the ones that spearheaded this kind of idea. Do you have a next assignment? We do. <laughs> <laughs> do we have a next assignment? We do. Can I talk about it? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> However, Leslie cannot join us this summer, but we've recruited Dr. Greg Jamison in the back row there, who will be, uh, who will be uh, leading our field group this year. Uh, Dr. Jamison uh, comes from UW-Milwaukee and helping us with this summer's recovery. Red tape. Yes. <laughs> so were there issues working with uh, the federal government, foreign government, and the academic institution? Um, I think it worked very well. Um, we just kind of kept moving forward. And if some red tape was put down, we just crossed over it and kept moving forward. And it, 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 was, a ma it was a major success for academia. Um, even after the summer of 2016, I received a phone call from an individual at DPAA, I'm not gonna name who, but they said that was the proudest day of their, their career. So it really had an impact on them as well. Any other questions? What other um, countries are doing this sort of recovery? What other countries are performing recoveries? Yes. Uh, uh, Germany, no yep, Germany, um, the French, uh, Austria, Italy, Japan. Uh, we actually worked hand in hand with a, a group called Quintai out of Japan. Um, there are a, a number of countries doing this as well. Uh, Belgium. Those are for US recoveries. It's interesting, different countries culturally approach this differently. There's not exactly the same sort of entity as the DPAA in other countries. Um, so like the British, if they find, especially in northern France and Belgium, there's lots of service members who are, who are missing. Um, they will, they, they have the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and so forth. They approach it in different ways that kind of tie into culture and, you know, the kind of the national attitudes towards um, the recovery of remains and things. That I, it's kind of an interesting question. Every country, and like in Germany, they have a private organization that does this. So there's a lot of interesting variations from country to country to country on how they do these things and, and the attitudes towards the recovery of missing service members. Are there sites that are found, you know, just by accident when, during construction and that kind of thing where people get older? Are sites found by accident? Yes. Um, I've actually received a couple of emails. Um, where an individual was walking through the woods, uh, I think it was in the Czech, uh, I think, if I recall, um, they found a stone with a blue star on it. And th there was always rumors that a US soldier was buried in this forest. So he had contacted me um, and said, I think this is the site where there's a US soldier. Um, but those are a little more difficult for us to go and scout. But if the project continues to grow, you never know. There have been cases uh, recently, there was a, a road project in eastern France, I think in the Ardennes, that um, just by sheer chance uncovered World War I U.S. service members from um, the Argonne and the Ardennes and so forth. Um, DPA's mandate actually starts at Pearl Harbor. They don't actually go before that typically, but I think in this case they actually did handle this, this case. So they're the, and they're the agency tasked with that, even though technically it was outside their, their scope. How is the farmer compensated for your work there? Well, I don't know if I can disclose that. <laughs> he was, though. He was well compensated. By the U.S. government? By the he, yeah, he was, uh, was the, the far owner of the land, uh, the landowner compensated? Yes, he was compensated very well by the U.S. government. How would you like to expand his research in the future? Mm. We all have day jobs. So, so well, that's yeah, <laughs> so that, that's the thing. Um, so everybody who participates in this project has a day job. 
So when we meet, we meet during lunchtime. When we put together presentations, it's usually after work. Um, so this isn't our active, we, nobody gets paid from this project. It's predominantly pro bono. Um, however, how do we want to see this expand? It's already expanding right now. So a year ago, so actually, let me step back. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit of a long story, but in 2015 is when we met with DPAA the first time and talked about this kind of idea of working with academia. And we gave them this kind of proposal how students can learn in the field as well as faculty, etc., staff. And it went very positive. So then we uh, performed the recovery in 2016. That was a success. And then at that time as well, DPAA um, uh, um, awarded the University of Wisconsin-Madison a contract to create a historical hub. And what this historical hub is, it's a location where anybody who has interest in recovery or has any information on actual sites can forward their information to this historical hub and a, his and a postdoc was recruited at, as, at the same time to lead this hub. But then also with that, we create the University of Wisconsin-Madison created a, a 600 level history course that focuses on actual MIA cold cases from World War II. So the current focus is Papua New Guinea, the 32nd, uh, and, and Buna and Gona. So it, you can see how this is not just focusing on one aspect of it, but now we have historical. We have anthropology, we have archeology, span we have emergency medicine, we have logistics. <laughs> I'm just a laborer. Um, <laughs> But it's a blend of people on this campus and students. If you notice some of the images, um, there's students participating in this. This year we're going to have three UW-Madison students participating with the Summers Project, as well as Ella will be joining us again. She's an undergrad at Colorado State. Um, so it's, it's not just you're learning, but it's rewarding. And to be honest, the, uh, Ryan and I attended the 600 level presentations where the kids presented, I call them kids, I apologize. The students presented their cases. You could see how impacted they were by that single case and they're still working on it because they're, leave, they're actually, the class ended this semester. Last and, semester. Or last semester, so they're still working on the cases. They actually drove to the, the uh, soldiers' hometowns to obtain more information. They're driving down to St. Louis tomorrow to even obtain more information. They're continually working on these cases because if you think of it, these are undergrads who are, what, 18, 19, 20 years old? World War II was many years ago. I mean, it was impactful when I saw the presentation. Yeah. yeah they have um, really, so the 30th, for those who may not be familiar, the 32nd Infantry Division was a National Guard division that was primarily made up of Wisconsin and Minnesotans and Michigan folks that was intended to go to Europe, but at the last minute was sent to New Guinea with MacArthur early in the war. And there's a lot of missing Wisconsinites. And so one of the things that we've always wanted to kind of focus on, if we could, are um, Wisconsinites. Nothing against Trenton, New Jersey. <laughs> um, but that's always been, being the University of Wisconsin, we would love to focus on Wisconsinites who are missing. And there's a lot of Wisconsinites missing in this little village called Buna, New Guinea, on the north coast of the um, New Guinea Peninsula there, on the, where it kind of tapers off. Um, so in answer to the question, I mean, time, money, people, the whole nine yards is what will make this expand. Frank and Evelyn, could you come up again, please? Thank you for coming to Madison. Thank you for coming to Wisconsin. Thanks for your very kind words and for being here. Um, we have a little memento here. These are medallions uh, from the university, and I'd like to give each of you one of these. And the W stands for Wisconsin. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? And on the back, 
is something that helps us helps drive us here. This is our statement of academic freedom. And it won't mean much to you now, but for many people in this room, the continual and fearless sifting and winnowing are drivers of what we try to do here. And so I hope you'll take a little bit of Wisconsin back home with you. And thank you for sending us Stephen Babcock in 1888. <laughs> thank you again. Sarah's here. Um, we're going to adjourn and head over to the set at Union South, if that's all right, because that's right where you guys are staying. And, you know, all you have to do is push the button to get up to the floor. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it.